Sanchez plays. Well, thank you so much. I want to stand Is this okay, Kim? I guess so. Okay. How's everyone doing? I know we're warm. We're gonna we're gonna get through these slides quickly and then start walking and talk about this. So I want to thank everyone for coming. This is my good friend Gordon Pattison. And uh, and and he's gonna talk to us about Old Bunker Hill and the Second Street Cable Car. So just very quickly, um, some upcoming announcements. The most important thing I can say today is to tell you that our next salon is Sunday, August 27th. And the topic is going to be the Arco Towers and its predecessor. No, 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 keep going. Only one direction, perfect. And the predecessor, the Richfield Building. Okay, so Nathan Marsak is going to talk about the Richfield Building 1928 Styles Clements, your favorite building, Gordon. Uh, it, was told, it was demolished in 1967. Arco Company tore it down. Next slide. And all the beautiful terracotta angels went away. That's a photo of Nathan hugging the terracotta angels from the Richfield building at UC Santa Barbara, where Kim's advisor, David Gephardt, salvaged them. Next one. And Nathan's just going to talk about this great old building and the current building, the 1967 AC Martin Arco Towers. We're going to walk over there. There's a lot to talk about. Next one. Um, so that's... And, and Nathan has a new moniker, Kim. It's the Cranky Preservation. Okay, so there you go. Okay, uh, next slide. Uh, we just, a couple things. Okay, yeah, all the images. There's Arco Towers. These are the elevator doors they salvaged from the old Richfield building, and they're now a public art installation in the courtyard of Arco Tower. There's the old Richfield building, the angel with Nathan hugging it, and a larger view. Quickly, okay, and just a couple things coming up. Kim and I get bus tours, and we have some interesting ones coming up. Sunday, seven days, I'm giving my South LA bus tour. It's a history of adobe, googie, and modernism in South Los Angeles County, and hot rods. Okay, it's totally awesome tour. You should get on it. Uh, other things we're doing, we're doing a special tour. We're doing a special tour September 23rd, which is a Saturday, about the history of the Los Angeles Times bombing from 1910. In 1910, the Los Angeles Times was bombed, and a, the former senior investigator of the arson division for the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, Mike Digby, is going to lead the tour. It's totally amazing. It's going to blow your mind. Let's go, and I think we just have one more. Uh, Kim, your Hollywood tour is September 30th, and that's going to be totally amazing. Okay, so get on the bus. We'd love it. And my birthday bus is not till November, which is coming up. I know we have. You're going to be on the birthday bus, Mom. I, I, I'm not allowed. I cannot say what the birthday bus. The birthday bus is the Saturday of Thanksgiving weekend. My mother's asking me to announce it, and we haven't figured out what it is yet. But we will. Okay. Okay, Gordon. I'll introduce you. To okay. No, I'll, I'll okay. okay. Great. Gordon, this is a photograph of you in front of the castle on uh, Old Bunker Hill, so I want you to introduce okay, yourself. I need you guys to get into like a similar space, not in front of the images. Perfect. Okay, so Gordon, I want you to tell us, we've got about seven photographs of your childhood on Old Bunker Hill. So Old Bunker Hill is that asparagus patch right behind us, right, where all the, the glass towers are. That used to be a Victorian neighborhood. And Gordon, you're going to spend a couple minutes telling us about that, and that will segue into the old Second Street cable car, which ran through the heart of this lost neighborhood. All right, go, and I'll, I'll control the slides. Thank you. Well, it's wonderful being here. Thank you, Richard. Um, uh, it's been four years now since I last gave a talk on Old Bunker Hill um, from Lava. So it's wonderful. I've, I've been in the audience many times since then, so it's really nice to be back. Um, and in fact, I did live up on Old Bunker Hill. Um, thought occurred to me a few years ago that I'm probably one of the few people that not only remembers it, but actually lived up there because we own some property up there. 
uh, on Bucket Hill, and I, I, do, I do miss it. Um, has any, did anybody actually see the Richfield building that Richard showed pictures of? Oh boy, I'm the last person. I'm the last person to have seen that too in the group here. So it was a wonderful building, and what didn't show in that photograph was the the tower that went up above. That tower was actually a representation of an oil derrick, and Richfield had oil derricks like that all up and down the west coast, from Canada all the way down to Mexico. They lighted up, but they were pointed the way to airports for pilots so they could go refuel. Wow. And that tower had neon lights that shot up the sides of the derrick, and there was a ball at the top that would then light up and had rays shooting out of it, and it would print out Richfield. It was a wonderful building. Anyway, as Richard said, this is me on Bunker Hill on Easter Sunday, 1947. The building in the back is the castle. We own the building next door whose steps I'm sitting on by the sidewalk. Okay. That is me and my Uncle Mickey the day that I had my first haircut. Uh, walking down the retaining wall that's in front of his building, which was the salt box. Now, if any of you know about Bunker Hill, you know that they tried to save the castle, which was ours, and the salt box that my Uncle Mickey owned. Uh, he's actually my grandmother's brother, so he's my great uncle. Um, walking down, there were retaining walls like this all over Bunker Hill. Practically every property had a retaining wall, um, a block retaining wall like that. Other way. There's me, uh, pointing to something across the street. What was across the street? The Capitol Apartments that friends of ours, the Markers owned, that uh, backed up on Bunker Hill Avenue, but its front was down on Grand Avenue in front of us. And that, those are my sisters and our, my dear friend Harp. Um, her name was actually Ollie Harp. Uh, Harp was her last name, but we very affectionately just called her Harp. Uh, she was our on-site manager, and she, was the woman that really took care of me. What's the next slide? Let me see the next one. Yeah, that's me and Harp out in front of the uh, castle. She took care of me. Um, Bunker Hill had a lot of... I love that question. Yeah. Bunker Hill, there was a lot of propaganda about Bunker Hill at the time about how it was a slum and it was crime ridden and all that sort of thing. I'm here to tell you that isn't the whole story. It really isn't the story at all. Bunker Hill in those days was largely a retirement community. Most of the people who lived up there were retired people that lived in these rooming houses. Harp was born in 1880, and uh, there was always something about me, I thought, as I was growing up that was old compared to my contemporaries, the kids I played with. And I think the reason is, I grew up with these people that were born when they were young. If you'd asked them, who's the Queen of England? They would have said Queen Victoria. She's my link to that era. And so I lived in Victorian Los Angeles. So I'm gonna, I've been living in preparation for this for the last four weeks or so in La Victoria and Los Angeles. So I'm gonna take you with me on a time travel, if you like, and we'll go back to Victoria and Los Angeles. There's another that's great this, photo. Yeah. That's a great photo. My grandmother planted that crepe myrtle tree out. That's my Uncle Bud and me, uh, that out in front of the castle. And there I am, picking up the crepe myrtle tree. That's the McDonald house next door over there. And uh, yeah, me and Shorts in front of the castle. Aww. And that's hard. This okay. really sweet lady. There, okay. That's the castle. Okay, here we go. Yeah. Okay, okay, that's the castle. That was at 325 South Bunker Hill Avenue. Gordon, where, where, if you wanted, we're going to go there today, but for everyone right now, where is this approximately right now? Uh, if you go and you stand in the um, food hall at the Wells Fargo Center, you're standing at the ground where the castle was located. However, 
you would have to climb up about four stories to be actually on this level of ground because they took off the top of the hill. The view out of this building towards the west or the east was you could see all of Los Angeles. You could see all the way to Santa Monica. Uh, it, was a, it was great. I used to climb up there and go out in the fire escape and, and look at that and watch the sun go down. That's it. That's okay. It. So, cable cars now? Now we're going to go cable cars, yeah. Now, you've all heard the, that, uh, you know that Tony Bennett left his heart in San Francisco, right? You know, where little cable cars climb halfway to the stars. You might not know that we had cable cars in Los Angeles also. We had a lot of them. Uh, the first of them was the Second Street cable car, and it ran up Second Street and it went over Bunker Hill. Why did they build that? Well, it was put in and largely um, financed by what was called the Los Angeles Improvement Company. Because to talk about the Second Street cable car, you have to you have to also talk about Crown Hill because that's the reason they put the cable car in. The Improvement Company, which was Whitmer and Yarnell, those were the, the guys that, that uh, were behind it transformed what had been a remote, inaccessible wilderness, which is Crown Hill, into an upscale residential development with 1,400 lots. So, so where is Crown Hill today? I'll show you. I'll show you a picture in a little while. Uh, yeah. Let me let me just finish oh, that slide, and then we'll go to that. The day, the way they advertise it: pure air, no fogs, cheap lots in the western edition of the Cable Road. The cost of the lots were $100, $200, or $300, depending on how close they were to the cable railway. This was Los Angeles' west side. It was called the West End. This is LA's west side. Okay, next slide. So, this is a slide, or picture taken in the 1880s from Bunker Hill looking west. This is Crown Hill over here. So, so where is, so what, what, what's there? Okay. Well, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the, this is the Belmont Hotel. The Belmont Hotel is the site of Belmont High School up on Crown Hill. So and the, the, the one, the, har the Harbor Freeway. The Harbor Freeway. Bunker Hill. The Harbor Freeway goes through this little valley now, and the interchange is over here. So they put in this, ca this uh, cable railway. It was Los Angeles' first mechanical, that means non-horse-drawn street railway. They had horse-drawn street railways in other places downtown on Broadway and on Spring Street and so on. But this is the first mechanical one. Uh, the construction started on April 27, 1885 at a cost of $100,000 to encourage the sales of property on Crown Hill so people could get over there and get back to the city. Um, by the Los Angeles Improvement Company, also was backed by John Hollenbeck, and Isaac Lord, who were movers and shakers in downtown Los Angeles, because they owned property at Second and Spring, which was the eastern terminus. Uh, it opened October the 14th, 1885. It ran uh, 6,940 feet, which is about a mile and a quarter, from Spring Street to First in Belmont on Crown Hill. There was a powerhouse that ran this thing that was located in about the midway point at Second and Boylston, and it ran from 6 a.m to 11 p.m., making 80 trips a day, running every 12 minutes. And that's pretty convenient. Excellent. Okay, this is a map, and I don't know whether you can all see this, but it shows two cable railways. One is the Second Street Cable Railway. Here's the plaza. Here's Main Street, Spring, Bunker Hill Avenue, Beaudry, Boylston, all the way over to First and it says Texas. That was its former name. It's Bel uh, Belmont now. The powerhouse was in the middle at about Boylston. Boylston still exists. So the, the Harbor Freeway again runs right, right through, right through here. Harbor Freeway is right, right through there. Um, shortly after the construction of the um, Second Street well, Railway, they also uh, cable railway. They did a. Um, Temple Street Railway, cable cable railway again, that ran up to Angelino Heights because Angelino Heights was developed by Prudent Beaudry, who had also developed Bunker Hill. So he bought land out there and did the same thing, subdivided it, sold the lots, and so people could get there. They built the, the uh, Temple Street 
cable railway. Where are we? Where are we? Oh, no, no. oh wait, that's right. We are somewhere in here right now. Uh, actually, uh, we're at Third Street. Yeah. We're somewhere in here. Okay. So there it is. We're up on, on the top of Bunker Hill now, looking at the cable railway, going, looking west. There's that hotel I talked about. Uh, they had to make some cuts in order to get this through here. Um, some recognizable things on the, on the uh, horizon. That's Mount Lee. That's where the Hollywood sign is. That's Mount Hollywood, which is where the Griffith Park Observatory is. And that's right there, you'll see in the next slide, is the powerhouse that ran this thing. Some of the workers out in front of it. Next slide. This actually isn't the Second Street Cable Railway, but it's inside of another one. It's the Pacific one that was down on Grand. But it shows you the cable mechanism inside. Next slide. So there's, the, there's one of the cars behind these guys who are the conductors, the guys who were actually ran it. Next slide. This is the cable hardware that went in the streets. The cable systems were designed by a Scottish engineer named uh, Andrew Halliday. He and his father came to the U.S. and went to California in the gold rush. Um, father didn't like, they didn't make a million dollars right away. Uh, so the father went home, but uh, Andrew stayed. And he got into mining. And they were having a problem hauling ore out of the mines because they used rope to pull the, the, the haul the ore out or pull the cars to haul the ore out. And the ropes wouldn't last very long; they'd break, they'd fray and break. So he got into making um, wire, uh, wire, metal wire rope, like the rollings. And so he eventually settled in San Francisco, where he observed teamsters driving their horses up the steep hills in San Francisco, pulling heavy wagons. And in some instances, the horses were so exhausted, they'd stop and be dragged back down the hill. So he thought, there's got to be a better way. I can use my cable, my wire rope, to embed it in the streets, in the cable, and pull things up the, without having to rely on the horses. So there's a rail here and a rail here. This is the slot through which they grabbed onto the cable that was buried under the street here. Next slide. You can see it here under construction. This isn't the second street. This is out in East LA um, in uh, uh, Boyle Heights. This is, the, is this the Aliso one? I think so. I, there's Downey, Aliso, yeah. yeah but it, it, this is out in Boyle Heights. But you can see that those uh, things that I was showing you before with the two men standing next to it are embedded in a trench in the, in the road and then they cover this over. But this is the, a perfect slide for the transition in technologies. There is the horse-drawn railway with horse poop in the middle of the road. <laughs> You'll notice that the streets are non-paved, they're dirt. Now that's going to be important in a while and you'll see why later. Okay, next slide. So let's go back to the 2nd Street Cable Railway. This is up on Bunker Hill, looking that way, towards the west. You can see the, the cuts that they had to make. Next slide. Cable railways in general, these are advantages. They're able to climb steep grades. The section between South Bunker Hill Avenue and Hope Street was a 27.7% grade, which was actually the steepest of any cable railway in the United States. It was steeper than the ones in San Francisco. They were quiet. There was no horse manure to foul the streets, because the streets of Los Angeles must have been full of horse manure, because there were lots of horses. Uh, or to clean up, and you didn't have to feed the horses, you didn't have to take care of the horses, there were no horses. Now, that, was, some, that was a real problem for people, is that the horses had to eat lunch. Yeah. And it really took a lot of time. Like, you really had to plan around... Yeah, and you couldn't run, run, you had to get another team, you yeah. can't run them from 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. Right. Some disadvantages, however, with the cables. 
you have, they always had to run the engine at full power to move that heavy cable at a constant rate of eight miles an hour. That required a lot of constant maintenance on these things. The cable traveled 100,000 miles in two years. And the friction caused it to wear out and break, but shut down service while they tried to replace the cable. And they weren't very efficient. Cable railways are not very efficient because only 16% of the power that's generated actually serves to move the cars and people. It's dragging that heavy cable miles and miles and miles. Next slide. So here we are back at, this is the top of Bunker Hill looking west. You can see the hotel over there. Um, this is that grade coming up from Hope Street. Next slide. And there they are at the top of that. Now, these are the two cars. You'll notice that one is enclosed and the other one's open. This one is called the Dummy. Uh, I don't know why it's called the Dummy. It was the, in cable railways, one of the cars was the Dummy. Um, there was a man, and the, if you've been on the cable cars in San Francisco, you know that there's a guy who operates the mechanism that grabs onto the cable. He's called the Grip Man, and that's the gripper that grabs onto the cable and then the car goes. Next slide. I'm going to read this to you because this is priceless. I got a bunch of stuff out of the newspapers. Um, I subscribe to newspapers.com and you can go in there and look at old newspapers and find out fascinating things which I've done over the last few weeks about this and my preparation for this. So they're talking about the Second Street Cable Railroad. At the west end of the, this cable road is the Belmont Hotel, the new Ellis Villa College, built to take the place of the old college, a real estate office, a grocery store, and a refreshment stand. And within one block stands several of the handsomest residences as any within the city limits. The price of the real estate is advancing rapidly, but prices have not yet reached more than one third the price asked and obtained in the southern part of the city. The completion of the two cable railways, that's the 2nd Street and Temple. Um, oh, I lost my place. Um, however. Have, however, have brought this delightful part of the city very near to the businesses, business center, and the beautiful hilltops are attracting the attention of wealthy businessmen who are buying and building rapidly in this pleasant retreat. We are but one mile from the courthouse and post office, and when we get the new government building on top of one of these hills, we shall put on aristocratic airs and look down on the neighbors in the flats below us. Next slide. Okay, so here we are. There's the grocery store. There's the real estate office, and there are the cable cars going across that little valley between Bunker Hill and Crown Hill. Uh, next slide. This is the eastern end, the eastern terminus of the uh, credit uh, cable car. You can see the cable car sitting there at the corner of Spring Street and Second Street. That's the temple, uh, the hill, uh, Hollenbeck block with the uh, B.F. Coulter department store and the ground floor. Now the photographer, now you can see there's a lot of horse traffic here. The photographer is going to go and stand over here and take a slide, a picture going west, looking west. Next. Go ahead. There it is. There's the B.F. Coulter in the Hollenbeck block. There's Second Street going up to Bunker Hill Avenue. That's the First Presbyterian Church in the corner of Broadway and Second Street. That's the City Hall. Before they built the 1888 City Hall, that was the City Hall. So it's actually the third City Hall. Great. Gordon, so I, we're going on the walk and, and we'll look at this when we're there. We'll look at this photo over there, but on the right, what's there now is the Los Angeles Times building. That's right. The Los Angeles Times is located over here. Yeah. Next slide. That's just another view of it with a few more trees. Actually, I think this one was taken before the previous one because there, the trees are gone in the, pre, in the previous one, and, there, and the previous one has electrical uh, lines, on street pole, uh, telephone poles. Next slide. Now, if you go one block west from where we were before, and you get to Broadway, this is Broadway. That's Second Street. That's the cable car. 
that's uh, Hill Street. Olive is up here, and then Grand is up on top. So, so what we're actually looking at, Gordon, is what was here before this market was here. Before what? This market was here. I mean, that's this is a photograph of where we are right now. Pretty much, yeah. We're real close, yeah, to that. We're a block east of the garden, west, south of that, yeah, because um, we're on third. But yeah, absolutely. We're, we're between Broadway and Hill Street. Yeah. And if you go up to the, if they, and they did, they, they got up to the top. This is up at Grand, looking east, down Second Street. So that's Olive. Clay Street's in here someplace. Hill Street's down here. Broadway's there. Spring is down there. That's that first Presbyterian church that I talked about. That's it, St. Viviana. Right there. Next slide. Now the photographer just turned to his right and he's looking south on Grand Avenue. This is Grand Avenue looking south from 2nd Street in 1885. Somewhere in there. Now the castle was on Bunker Hill Avenue. So, so just where would the castle and salt box have been okay. in relation to this one? So this is 2nd Street. Uh, 3rd Street would be here. And if you went up a little hill here, you would be at the highest point on Bunker Hill, which was South Bunker Hill Avenue, north-south, parallel with Grand. And we were in the 300 block, which means between 3rd and 4th Street on South Bunker Hill Avenue. So we're up there. Okay, I showed you this slide before, but I, I found this picture a few years ago, well, probably 10 years ago now, that um, fascinated me, and I'll tell you why. First of all, it's got those recognizable, it's got a recognizable skyline. You, you know these hills. We live in the, with these every single day. Um, this is up on South Bunker Hill Avenue at 3rd Street. Remember I said I live between 3rd and 4th Street on South Bunker Hill Avenue, so I'm just over here. That's 3rd Street. That's 2nd Street. There's the power station for the 2nd Street cable car. The Harbor Freeway went right through there. This is about where the Alta Vista, which is where, if anybody knows John Fonte and Ask the Dust, that's where he lived, right there. Okay, so the other reason that that slide fascinated me is because it showed the Belmont Hotel, remember I said the Belmont Hotel. And I knew that my father went to Belmont High School, and so there had to be some connection between the Belmont Hotel and Belmont High School. Because my dad grew up in Bunker Hill and walked over to Crown Hill to go to high school at Belmont High School. <clears throat> the building actually opened in September uh, 1884 as the Ellis Villa College. Um, now, this, I love this. I, I can't think of a more perfect uh, statement of Victorian social morality than this one. The purpose was an institution to prepare young women for the various duties of life, that they may, may discharge them with honor to themselves and advantage to our best and highest human relations. This was published in the LA Herald, June of 1884. So that's the building right after it was built. Do I have five minutes to tell about the, uh, there's a story, I found this in the newspaper and I don't have a slide for it, no, I just have to tell it to you, because it's a great story. Um, it was called the um, Hannah Lasogue Affair. It was not a romantic affair, but I think it was far from that. Um, Reverend Ellis built this college, and named it after himself. He was the reverend pastor of that first Presbyterian church that you saw down uh, at Second and Broadway. <coughs> the school opened in September, and so he hired staff, he hired teachers, they had a, admitted a class. And among the teachers was a Madame Plasso, who uh, was hired to teach music and voice, um, and probably French. 
and to sing in the First Presbyterian Church on Sunday. She was going to be paid, she had a written contract, and be paid $800 a year for her teaching and $300 a year to sing in the church. Well, somehow in that first month, she managed to alienate everybody at the school. The fellow teachers, the students, the staff, who called her that French woman. <laughs> well, they decided they didn't want her anymore. Nobody could get along with her. So they asked her to leave. So I guess she wouldn't because one night she was down in the city and came back and found all of her belongings out of her, outside her room, her trunks, her everything. And there was a huge hue and cry, stomping up and down the stairs and yelling and everything else. And she went in and uh, the Reverend Hannah was the guy who ran the school. And he was a minister as well. And his wife was had had dysentery for eight months and had been in the hospital for eight months and only recently came home but still was debilitated. So their daughter ran out in the hall to quiet down Madame Lasso. Madame Lasso allegedly, and I'll get to this in a minute, but according to one of their story, Madame Lasso uh, hit her and bloodied her lip, the daughter. So um, the Reverend Hannah came out and tried to calm things down, got maybe a little hot under the collar, but grabbed her, and according to Madame Lasso's version of the story, he choked her, throttled her, she was worried about her voice being affected, and hit her in the eye. Uh, things calmed down, and she said, where am I to stay tonight? And apparently, finally, they let her into her room, and according to her story, they locked her in and didn't let her out to the middle of the next afternoon. So she got out and she did two things. She went downtown and met a friend um, who told her that she should press charges, which she immediately did. And the second thing she did is she went to the newspapers. And the, the newspapers of, the, of Los Angeles are filled with this story for the whole fall of 1884, absolutely filled with it. And the, and the best tradition of supermarket tabloid journalism, the papers took sides and um, accused other their rival papers of being biased and prejudiced uh, against one or the other of these people uh, on the two sides. Um, I have to read you what, what that was written in the mirror. Uh, he who lays hands upon a woman, except in kindness, is a wretch indeed. So it went to trial. They tr his lawyers tried to get a change of venue to Wilmington, but that apparently didn't happen because the trial was conducted in November in L.A. And uh, they all gave testimony, and uh, the people at the school tried, they tried to call the people at the school to get character witnesses against Madame Lusso, but that was objected to and was uh, not allowed. But they were going to say that actually what had happened is Madame Lusso assaulted the daughter, and uh, she was entirely at fault, and she swore up and down in the halls and made a ruckus, and nobody liked her and everything else. And um, they backed up the Reverend Hannah and said that uh, he pushed her firmly but gently back against the wall to calm her down and to restrain her. Well, they went to trial and it ended in a hung jury. They declared a mistrial. There were seven votes for acquittal and five for conviction. Madam Lista, well, let me tell you about what Reverend Hannah. This did not apparently um, adversely affect his reputation. Because shortly after this, he left Ellis College and opened his own college down in Olive, which he ran for many years, didn't have any trouble getting students or faculty, and he ended up the superintendent of the Hollenbeck Home. He finished his career as the superintendent of the Hollenbeck Home over in East LA. Madame Lasso, apparently with the backing of all the, the number of movers
movers and shakers gentlemen in Los Angeles, Hollenbeck, Nado, Childs, a bunch of these guys, uh, let her open a college. They backed her. She opened a, a music school in the Nado Hotel. And she, there are advertisements all over the newspapers in 1884, 85, 86 for, for her to, uh, accepting students. And I think she taught French too. Um, and she said, Singing should be taught to young ladies by a woman and not a man. <laughs> now, what happened to Madame Rousseau? This is interesting. I'm looking through the newspapers, and in 1894, she turns up in all of all places, Nashville, Tennessee. Now, maybe she wore out her welcome in Los Angeles. I don't know, but she ended up in Nashville, Tennessee, where she opened a music school. And then, I'm looking through the papers, and in 1898, she's in San Francisco, um, where she opened a music school. And six months later, a woman calling herself Madame Louise, but in the paper says it's actually Madame Rousseau, is in jail in San Jose, because in an altercation with her landlord, she threw acid in his face. So Madame Lassaud must have been some kind of person. Um, it turns out in that it turns out in that story, she actually it turns out that she is actually not well. Her name is really Emily Greeny. She's English. She had um, apparently some talent as a youngster, and their family sent her to the Paris Conservatory uh, to study singing, where she acquired a French name and a French persona. That's the last I found of her. I don't know what else happened. I, I thought that was a good story. Drink some water. Okay. Let's get through these slides, Gordon, to get on our walk. Okay. Next slide. Beaumont Hotel. Uh, in June 1886, the Ellis College occupied new buildings at the site, and at least the original building, uh, which opened as the Belmont Hotel. And in the paper it says, built on 15 acres, ornamented and improved in the best style. It is situated on a high plateau, free from frosts. Frosts in Los Angeles? I take the LA Times, and I have a habit of looking at the weather on the neck. Uh, you know, the high and the low and the record for the date. All the record lows almost invariably are in the 1880s and the 1890s. Uh, it was a lot colder here. I think maybe global warming, but also because the city wasn't very developed and it didn't retain or generate heat the way that the city does now. <clears throat> There's, that's from the paper. Um, on the hill at the terminus of the 2nd Street Cable Road, cars every 10 minutes, magnificent view, ocean breeze, 17 acres of hotel grounds, drives, walks, lawns, flowers, fruit trees, wide piazzas. Each room, a front room, bath rooms on each floor, ladies' parlor, gentlemen's reading room, lawn, tennis, croquet, livery stable, uh, in connection with the hotel, special rates for the summer. That's a nice place. And that's the way it was after they converted it into the hotel. Next slide. Okay, so a photographer went up in that tower, that, that's 80 foot tower, and he took photographs out the north side. This is actually kind of northwest. There's Mount Lee where the Hollywood sign is. There are some of those handsome houses that they talked about. Next slide. This is going pretty much directly north. There's Mount Hollywood again with the Griffith Park Observatory. This is First Street. The, this is was called Texas, but it's now Belmont. That's where the cable car ended. So this was taken up on the hotel. Next slide. And this slide. This, he turned toward the ocean, and when I first saw this, this blew my mind away. There's nothing there. Los Angeles is totally empty. Now, this, I've seen the back of this photograph, and it says that this is a view looking south, which would make that Palos Verdes and that Signal Hill, and that's the park down there. Ah, uh, I don't know, is it looking west? Is that Malibu and that Baldwin Hills? I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. But in any case, it just blew my mind. There's nothing there. 
Okay, so they, and they put in a 2nd Street lane, a 2nd Street park. I was located at the intersection of 2nd Street and Shoreline Drive, which is now Glendale Boulevard, approximately where the Bob Baker Marionette Theater is located now. Next slide. There it is. What a lovely place. Here's 2nd Street. That's 1st Street. They came together, and then they continued on as 1st Street up to uh, Belmont Avenue. Um, that's now, this park now is called Beverly Avenue. Uh, and Lakeshore Drive, which is now Glendale Boulevard, went that way. Next slide. I'm not going to read this because this is priceless. It is not generally known that there is a beautiful park of 17 acres near the terminus of the 2nd Street Cable Road, which is being handsomely improved, already contained a fine grove of ornamental shade trees. In the midst of the welcome shade is a dancing platform on which the youth and beauty of the city are wont to trip the light, fantastic toe. In the park is a beautiful lake of clear, sparkling spring water. The park is being supplied with rare animals and birds already containing monkeys of a variety of species, parrots, cockatoos, etc. A black bear and some deer have been secured and will soon be placed in their corner in the park. Swings, teeterboards, trapeze, bars, etc. abound. Altogether, making this a pleasant, shady resort from the warm, dusty streets of the city, the entrance to the park is within 30 feet of the 2nd Street Cable Road. Next slide. Isn't that a great place? And here it is on a foggier day, looking back the other way. So this would be Lakeshore Drive, which is now Glendale Boulevard. Next slide. There's the uh, dancing, dance platform. There's actually a beer hall over here. There's some swans out here in the lake. Another slide looking from a little further back. That's the Temple Street cable car. Next street slide. Out in front of its power station. So this is Angelino Heights, which is what that the Temple Street cable car service. That's Temple Street. There's the power station. That's Edgeware Drive. That's still there. This is Angelino Heights. That is Carroll Avenue. And those houses are still there. It's 1897. <clears throat> and I mentioned the Pacific Railways. That's the other cable system. This was more extensive. This went to East LA and, and points south and west as well. And down a little bit further, down on Grand, down by 9th Street. Next slide. Okay, now in my newspaper readings, I came across this, and I included this in the best tradition of the uh, esoteric true crime bus tours. Um, and I have to preface this by saying there is in this account from the newspaper a word that is nowadays considered to be offensive, describing Chinese people. I don't make apologies for it. I don't condone it. I, it's, we call it the, we'll call it the C word. It's not the worst C word there is for Chinese people. But um, that's why I copied this, and you can see it in its Victorian historic context. Okay, next slide. Chinese murderers shoot a white man through the abdomen. The practice of abusing Chinamen once more met with a disastrous result. Last night near Beaudry Avenue, as the last 2nd Street cable car was leaving the foot of the street at 11.20, four Chinamen got on, two taking seats in the dummy, that's the front car, and the other two inside the car. Uh, on the dummy, there were also three laborers employed by E.C. Burlington, the contractor of Number 8 Beaudry Avenue. These men, after the cars were on the way, commenced playing practical jokes and abusing the Chinamen. And uh, finally, when uh, nearing the engine house, they threw into the road the hats of the two Chinamen on the dummy. These Chinamen got off to pick up their hats, and the laborers then also left the car. 
Upon reaching a little bridge over the ditch near Baudry Avenue, they renewed hostilities with the Chinamen when one of them pulled out a revolver and commenced blazing away at the white man. Three shots were fired by him and Charles Freezer, a, a Swede, fell to the ground. The Chinamen then disappeared in the dark and the companions of the man who was, had fallen also ran away. And this goes on and describes his agony and he died, that sort of thing. Um, why did Chinamen, or Chinese people, men? Maybe think they had to carry guns? Why did they feel threatened? This isn't very long after the Chinese massacre in which 19 Chinese people were wantonly murdered down in Chinatown by uh, gangs of white people. Next slide. Okay, what happened to the Belmont Hotel? Now, there's a, a misprint here. This should read 1887. So this is only a year and a half after the hotel opened. It burned down. That's what happened to it. According to the Los Angeles Hero of the Count, dated December 17, 1887, remember, the fire started in the kitchen where a Chinese cook was heating a pot of grease on the stove when it tipped over, ignited, and set the kitchen on fire. Many of these buildings, if they, were, if they burned down in the old days, they burned down in kitchen fires. Um, the nearest fire station was at 9th and Main. By the time the firemen arrived, the fire was too advanced uh, to be extinguished. Next slide. And that's why. Wow. That's the fire truck on its way, as a pump truck on its way to, to a fire, not that one, but the a fire. And here's, here it is burning down. Uh, it was apparently a slow enough progressing fire that although the firemen couldn't get there fast enough, people got a lot of stuff out of the building. You see furniture out here, and you see they got the luggage and everything out. And this is from the hotel, uh, the paper. The hotel on the inside was as attractive as on the outside. The furniture was elegant, and the latest styles and conveniences included everything from modern, that modern science and art could suggest. There was nothing lacking which could have added to the comfort of the guests. Outside, the grounds were laid off in no other, like no other in the city. There were large beds of flowers laid out by an artistic hand and pleasant walks for the guests. And no more attractive hotel could be imagined. And this, with its contents, was nothing but a heap of ashes by noon yesterday. Okay, so what happened to the cable car? The Los Angeles Improvement Company had sold most of its lots on Crown Hill by 1887. And this is true of most of the streetcars that we had in Los Angeles. They were put in and financed by real estate developers to get people out to their real estate development so they could sell them lots. And once they sold all the lots, they weren't very interested in subsidizing these railways any longer. So the Second Street, I mean the Los Angeles Improvement Company sold the Second Street Cable Railway in January 1888 for $130,000. They made $30,000 on it uh, on the sale of it, capital gains, to a James McLaughlin who uh, soon encountered unforeseen problems. It was not a good investment for him. In February, March of 1888, right after he bought it. The service was shut down because the cable broke and replacement could not be done because of flooding. Uh, the cables, the wire cables lasted about two years and had to be replaced every two years. In the summer of 1889, the city of Los Angeles denied McLaughlin a permit that to extend his Cohenga um, Valley Railroad from Hollywood into the city where it, he wanted it to hook up with it. so passengers from the Second Street Cable Railway could transfer and go out west to Hollywood and other places like that. So the city denied that permit. Next slide. You see, now this is this is you've heard the song It Never Rains in Southern California. Except sometimes it does. And when it does, it pours, man, it pours, if you know that song, right? So in December 24th, 1889, according to newspaper accounts of the time, there was a terrible storm that caused flooding, washing mud and debris into the cable slot and fouling the mechanism. Remember, these are dirt roads, they're not paved. So that's what happened. The service was again shut down, and McLaughlin could not afford the cost of repairs, and he declared bankruptcy. 
So the line was abandoned in 1890, and thus becoming the first, not only the first cableway in Los Angeles, but the first cable railway to go out of business and be abandoned in Los Angeles. This is not the second streets of cableway, but that's the kind of flooding that Los Angeles often, when it rained, had. And that, that uh, streetcar is mired in mud. So eventually they removed the railway from, this is Second Street, that's uh, Hill Street, that's Olive, uh, Clay is up there and, and Grand is up at the top. They dug it up and they're taking out the, the railway. What happened at Crown Hill? Oil happened on Crown Hill. Discovered in 1890 and made famous by Edward Doheny's successful well in 1892, the Los Angeles oil field was once the top producing oil field in California, accounting for more than half the state's oil in 1895. In its peak year of 1901, approximately 200 separate oil companies were active on the field, which is now entirely overbuilt by dense residential and commercial development. Next slide. This is a, a I know this is hard to see, but this is the, the oil field. Those are all oil wells. Um, raise this up just a little bit. There's the plaza right there. This is Sunset. This is Temple. That's First Street. That's where it meets Second Street. This is Belmont. And First Street, that's where Belmont High School, where the hotel was, was located right there. This is Angelino Heights. That's Edgeware. That's Carroll Avenue, right there. And if you went up on the top of, Car of let's say, Carroll Avenue, and you look this way, you look south, next slide. This is what you'd see. This is Crown Hill from up on Angelino, uh, Angelino Heights. Those aren't trees. Next slide. They're oil dairies. Remember, this had already been settled and houses built here. Right? So they built all their own, they put on all the old oil dairies. And these people own their own plot. Right? Next slide. So they had oil wells in their backyard, they had oil wells in their front yard. That's why there were 200 oil companies. Go back just a minute. That house is still there. Next slide. That's it. Wow. This is Court Street. This is this is Court Street. This is Edgeware. Court Street, Edgeware. That house is still there. Minus the oil. This is the intersection of First Street, which is now Beverly up here, and um, Belmont. That's now. This is the Los Angeles Fire League or something like that, Gardens League. It's too bad that wasn't there when the hotel got on, caught on fire. <laughs> that's, you saw this slide before, that's now. So that's second and Broadway. That's second and Broadway. This is uh, break, second and spring. That's now, that's the LA Times. This is up looking east from Grand. That's now. That's looking south on Grand from the intersection of 2nd and Grand. That's now. That's the uh, road. This is almost impossible to get an equipment shot. You'd have to go up on top of the road and take that picture, which I wasn't able to do. But I showed you this one because this is what I remember. This is when I lived on Bunker Hill. South Bunker Hill Avenue and 2nd Street looking west. That's Hope, that's Flower above the 2nd Street Tunnel. Figueroa's down there, 2nd Street goes out that way. That's about all you can see now. Next slide. And it doesn't go like that because they took the top of Bunker Hill, out, of Bunker Hill off. That one is that side from up on the hotel looking north. Next slide. This is really hard to get a picture of nowadays, but this is from the football stadium at Belmont High School. You can make out Mount Hollywood right there. Next slide. 
All right, this is interesting. Remember the Second Street Park and this lake? That's this, this, yeah, that's Toluca. Can you go on next one? This is really hard to get a picture of because you'd have to be up on one of these apartment buildings to get that picture. So this is up where I could get to to take the picture. Next one. That's Second Street right there. That's, you, you just can't get close to it on ground level. Next slide. So remember, this is First Street, Second Street where they come together by the lake. That's Toluca. Next slide. Yeah. That's Toluca. Yeah. There's the Bob Baker Marionette Theater. Here's Second Street. That's First Street up there yeah. on that overpass. Here's Lake Shore. Next slide. I'd have to go over there, but you can't see that very well. But this, this is, a, uh, I think, important. Why did they build that overpass? Why did they put First Street over the top of Second Street? The, you see what that says? Belmont um, Station Apartments. That's where the tunnel came out for the subway. It's behind this place. And it came, the subway came right across there. There's a lot of intersecting traffic, so they built this overpass. Love it. Okay. Last slide. Please. Last slide. They have in their lobby, in their lobby, they have a series of photographs. So, how many of you were on the walk last month when we went into the subway station? They have a display of photographs of, of that in there, um, and this is from the newspaper that's on. It's on display um, at the time with a diagram showing what the subway station is going to look like. So I photographed it off the wall. Um, they have a much more extensive photograph display, but to get up to it, you have to tell them you want to rent an apartment. <laughs> <laughs> so I wasn't able to go up there. Maybe we can talk them in. Yeah. All right, you did it. Everyone think for the water. It was fantastic. Gordon, go sit down for a minute. You did a good job. All right, I, I'm gonna it's going to take uh, about five, ten minutes to break everything down, and then we're going to go for our walk, okay? Uh, if everyone got the email, you downloaded the Pocket Sites app so we could look at some of these old photos and we're on site. Anyone I'm going to bring my iPad. What? If anyone didn't check in? Yes, if, if anyone didn't sign in, if anyone didn't register and is here, please sign up with Gigi to sign the waiver. So we'll blast off in about five, ten minutes. So you can go hit the head, um, go grab a, a, a something cold to drink, and then Gordon, we're going to walk the route, right? So we're going to walk out here on Broadway, and then just walk on 2nd of Broadway, up to the top of Bunker Hill, and we'll look at some old photos on the way. And then we'll end up uh, at Angel's Flight, and you can talk about the salt box and the castle on Angel's Flight. All right, so everyone thank Gordon one more time. That's great. Okay. So, uh, I have, if everyone opens pocket sites, we can... <clears throat> We can do this. Pocket sites. Okay, so it's the Second Street Cable Car Tour. It's Old Second Street Cable Car is the tour. Yeah, someone's on it. I can hear them. Okay, so let's go. Let's go to Second and Spring because we're not going to walk to Spring because there's nowhere to stand. So. Yeah, I took the picture in the middle of the intersection on the Sunday morning. Okay, so if you go to Second and Spring, you can look and see what the intersection of Second and Spring looked like in 1888. Okay, so Gordon, I'm going to give you the microphone. We are on Second Street at Broadway. The terminus of the Second Street cable car was just one block to the east, Second and Spring. We're not going to walk there because of construction. There's nowhere to stand for all these people, which is a good problem to have. So I want you to set the stage. Okay. Okay, so um, this is, this was the, in that era, this is where the city had developed. It, it started down by the plaza and gradually moved in a southerly direction um, and had reached this area by the uh, 1880s, maybe a little earlier. There were houses down here and farms and vineyards and orchards and things like that. 
um, in this area, but it, uh, as the city grew, and especially in the 1880s when there were uh, real estate booms and people could get here easily to Southern California after they built the railroads uh, and connected Southern California and Los Angeles with the other parts of the country, uh, they were actually promoted uh, people coming here from the east, the railroads okay. did, by um, the cutting the fare to one dollar to come to the west to Los Angeles for a dollar. So lots of people came out here. So the city started growing pretty fast down in this direction. Uh, and they needed more room. And uh, so they started going west too. And the, these um, movers and shakers that uh, had some money would buy land and um, develop a re real estate development and start selling property. These people got off the train for the $1 fare. Um, one thing I didn't mention was that when they built the cable railway to save money, they only had a single track. Both cars ran on a single track. The ones going east and the ones going west were on a single track. And there was a cutout, a turnout, uh, where they would um, pass one another. So the downhill car would let loose of the cable and coast through the, um, the cutout while the uphill car was coming on, on that side. And they had a time, I guess, just right and uh, until it passed and then the uphill car would resume. Uh, so that, that's how they did that. And, and uh, when you get to uh, the next site, which is this one, at 2nd and Broadway, which if you continue the tour, you get to number three, you'll see the intersection of 2nd and Broadway. And that photograph was taken from right over there, looking that way. Uh, now, you'll notice that uh, when you look now at the, this western view, there's a tunnel there uh, that wasn't there in those days. The tunnel was put in in 1924 to facilitate uh, automobile traffic going to the western part of the city so they wouldn't have to go just through the 3rd Street Tunnel. This was a, a double bore, wider tunnel than uh, the 3rd Street Tunnel, which is a single bore, um, and uh, was narrower. Uh, or you'd have to go north and go over Temple or sunset to go, or go all the way around Bunker Hill, uh, down to Sixth uh, Street or something like that, to get around to go west. So they dug this tunnel, um, but there is a bit of road, Second Street roadway, uh, on the north side of the tunnel, so we can actually walk up right up there. All right. So, so give me the microphone. Okay. So before we leave, I really want to try and orient everyone. Look at me. Don't look at your phones. I know this is really hard to imagine, but. There were all these hills behind us, and City Hall, City Hall is over there. This area, City Hall is just behind this Los Angeles Times building, right? This is the parking lot for the Los Angeles Times. If you walk in a straight line through the building, you would hit the corner of City Hall at first in spring, right? Everything north of here and west of here was an impenetrable maze of, of 19th century streets. Okay, just hard to understand with hills, really, really complicated. And starting with the tunnel went in 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 the 20s. The Hill Street tunnels went in earlier in the mid-teens. With the construction of City Hall in 1926, you have the city and the county of Los Angeles saying, we're done with 19th century Los Angeles. We're going to straighten Spring Street. Spring Street stopped at Temple. It didn't continue. We're going to straighten. We're going to continue and straighten Spring Street. We're going to rip out all these old 19th century jails that the Sheriff's Department has built up over the decades. All this beautiful stuff was just gone. They just tore down 19th century Los Angeles. And what we see now is just a shell of that. And there's really nothing left. And let's walk one block up. Oh, go ahead. If you look to your behind you over there, you'll see some photographs of right. what was here. These are buildings that were right there yeah. on Second on uh, Broadway. These are right here. This is a view looking down Broadway. The one on the right. You can see the old the tower of the old city hall on the left uh, panel from Second Street, looking um, south on Broadway. Uh, so if, if everyone looks at my least favorite um, bas-relief mural in Los Angeles, which is the mural on the Los Angeles Times parking garage, you see that right just across the street? It has the really nice aluminum screen next to it with the pressed aluminum. Okay, that used to be the old Los Angeles City Hall. 1888, 
1924, 20, uh, 20, okay, they basically tore it down in 25, but yeah. So that city hall was designed by Curlet and Eisen. If you've heard of Walker and Eisen, that's Eisen's father. The Eisen of Walker and Eisen, this is his father. They did a bunch, they did several county buildings. We'll get to that later. So that was city hall. And when they tore that city hall down, one of the, the salient aspects of the demolition of that building was about a thousand really pissed off feral cats that lived in it that, that had to move north into, in, in, that had to move north. And you're laughing, Kim, but it's true. You read newspaper reports and the nights were just filled with howling feral cats that had lost their place. They, they, this is where they slept and they had to find other places and they were I'm really laughing. pissed off. I'm not laughing. I'm really, I'm angry They're for the cats. really pissed off. All right, so that was City Hall, and let's keep walking um, west, and Gordon will, oh, yeah, anything. Yeah. Uh, you remember I pointed out the First Presbyterian Church, that real high spire, that was right there. Yeah. Reverend Ellis, Ellis College, that was his par parish, it was his church. He was the a minister of that church, so he could get on the, the cable car and go right down there. Uh, another reason they wanted to get rid of Madame Lassau, they said, she might sing okay in concert halls, but her singing was not suitable for church singing, for singing <laughs> church songs. Gordon, have a sip of water. Tour guide's got to stay hydrated, man. But thank you, Gordon. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Gordon, lead the way. We'll uh, start walking up to the hill. No, I know. I know. That was back Yeah, Wikipedia page. Good, well you'll help. I will. I love Pam. Alright, let's get us oriented. We are at second in Hill. So Gordon, um, I believe the opening of there we go. Uh, I just watched a Burt Lancaster film last night, Trapeze. Anyone seen Trapeze? Tony Curtis, Burt Lancaster? Fantastic film. The opening of the Burt Lancaster film Crisscross is right here. You can watch it on you can watch the opening on YouTube. The tunnel. Do you want to do you want to talk? Tell about yeah, it's not here. It's it's. I'm sorry. That's one block up. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we're gonna continue walking. We're gonna stop just up the street and talk about Clay Street. I want to linger for a moment on the Kawanda Hotel because uh, we're about to walk up onto Bunker Hill, Gordon. Your old, your old stomping ground. And one of the salient aspects of of Bunker Hill was that these great mansions. The castle and the salt box are great examples. What these great grand old mansions were converted into rooming houses, single room occupancy hotels is where some of them were. And uh, when Bunker Hill was cleared in the late 1960s due to the brilliance of the CRA, there we go. Uh, when Bunker Hill was cleared, these single room occupancy hotels all went down. The last single room occupancy hotel on Bunker Hill left standing was the Kawanda, it was called the Aster. And uh, our friend Bunny, Bunny was a evangelical minister who didn't leave the Northern Hotel at Second and Olive for the last five years of the Olive's, of the Northern's life. She was evicted uh, forcibly by the Sheriff's Department in 1968, 67, 68, and they relocated her to the Astor, which is now the Kawanda. So when you when you see the Kawanda, think of Bun our friend Bunny, who was taught by Sister Amy Semple McPherson how to minister. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. Bunny's great. I love Bunny. So, Gordon, we're at Second and Hill. Um, go. Okay. <laughs> Bunny, Bunny, they, they got Bunny out. You know, she wasn't going to leave her room. But you, you've seen the pictures of um, them evicting uh, people from uh, Chavez Ravine. It's the same story here. Uh, the CRA took um, all of the land. You did not have a choice. Uh, uh, well, you could chain yourself in your room and eventually they'd come and get wire and chain cutters and drag you out. <laughs> or um, you could get a shotgun and resist. Eventually they'd get you out. Uh, if you were a property owner, you really didn't have a choice. You took their check and you moved on. Um, and they uh, they tore down all those places. The, the castle, which is the building that we owned, my grandmother bought it in 1937. It had been turned into a rooming house in the early part of the uh, 1900s, that building was built as a mansion, single family residence in the 1880s, the early 1880s, about the time we're talking about on a cable car. And um, shortly after the turn of the century, 
uh, the Donegan family that lived there for about 10 years moved out and they moved over to um, Angelino Heights and uh, and the, they sold the, the castle and again using newspapers.com I put in the search engine the address of the castle which was 325 South Bunker Hill Avenue and I found ads in the no local newspapers for rooms for rent in that building in 1906 so it was turned into a rooming house very early on and the, and the, uh, the whole character of Bunker Hill started to change so shortly after the turn of the century. We're, we're, we're going to be at the location, yeah. I don't want okay. to go to the castle. All right. so, so. What I want to do is I want to point out this this hillside, okay, and I know you think, well, it's just a bunch of dirt, okay. This Aren't dirt, getting ready to build something? <laughs> this dirt, this hillside has been exposed since 1921, okay. Okay, this hill has been here untouched since 1921. All of Bunker Hill has been completely razed. They took off 45 to 50 feet of topsoil on different spots of this hill. It's been graded, it's been paved over. This hillside remains untouched since 1921. You can't say that about anything else on Bunker Hill. Yep, yeah, that is, that is, that is, a but Gordon, you probably scampered down this hillside as a child. Okay. Gordon, I want, do you carry a little vial of it around yeah, your neck? Yeah. <laughs> what I want to do is I want to walk up to the top of this grade just right here, and there's a little walkway in between the two buildings, between the Colburn School and Angela's Plaza, and I want to talk about Clay Street. Okay, so we'll just start walking. Gordon, why don't, you, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, follow Gordon. on your app. This is the iconic photo of Angel's Flight. This is the last remaining portion of Clay Street left. This is the street that ran under Angel's Flight. Yeah, this is the iconic photo. This is Clay Street. That's it. That's all that's left of Clay Street. That's it. Wow. That's it. That's all that's left of Hold it up for me, Richard. Ah, there we go. Ah, thank you. Holy moly, can you believe That's that? That's so great. Okay, hold on, we'll get out of the way. This car's moving? Okay, let's get out of the way. Okay, so this is, every people that have the Pocket Sites app, this is, so this is the last section of Play Street. <laughs> I need your help now. I need okay. you to explain what this watercolor rendering is of Clay Street. Oh, oh, what is it? It's the WPA watercolor rendering. Oh, okay. So I want you to explain. So this is the second image is a is a architectural elevation done in watercolor by a WPA artist. Work progress administration. And um, it's just a uh, street of the buildings on Clay Street at second. And Kim, I want you I'm to not giving a turn. You are. I'm okay. videotaping. I'll, Thank you. I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> okay. So, in, in the, so Gordon, you're going to help. Oh, okay. Turn my microphone. I, I have a microphone. Yes. I'm yeah. videotaping. You have a I know you can hear. No, you, everyone can hear me just fine. It's, it's a burden. Okay. So, Clay Street is this really short street that runs under Angel's Flight. It's about a block and a half, it two went, and a half. It went from 2nd Street to 4th Street. So it's two uh, blocks long. It's the little dirt road that runs under Angel's Flight. Whenever you see the iconic shot of Angel's Flight, the cars, you're on Clay Street. That's it. That's the last part left of Clay Street. Okay, so there are these beautiful renderings, architectural renderings of the Civic Center from 1934 in the Los Angeles City Archives, which is at Piper Tech in back of Union Station across the street from Denny's. It's where the LAPD crime lab is. It's where the heliport is. 
So we're LAPD's helicopter division, Arrow, but we're Arrow's not what LAPD calls it, it's the sheriff's room calls it. Ramirez? Ramirez, yeah, okay. Ramirez and, yeah. Vig and, and Vin. You can park for free there. <laughs> you can park for free there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you can. Really? So, yes. So there are these beautiful watercolor renderings of elevation and height and cross sections as best possible. And Gordon, why was the county financed through the, the federal government, why were they so interested in, in, in documenting this neighborhood? They wanted to tear it down. Right, they wanted to tear it down. So, so if they could document it, then they could make a good case that this is a, these are all slums and they all have to go, and that absolutely positively was not true. To meet, to meet the, the criteria to remove this, it had to be a blighted area. And so they had to make the case that it was blight, um, which it wasn't. Although the city did everything they could to turn it into the slum that they said it was, the area was redlined, so uh, nobody and what, could- And what is redlining? Redlining, well, the, this grew out of the National Housing Act, which is a new 1930s New Deal uh, piece of legislation that was supposed to take substandard housing and improve people's lives by building them new housing. Um, and so one of the parts of that was that they did a housing survey all around the country in the big cities, um, including Los Angeles. Uh, it, was, it was like a census. It was called a housing census. Um, and in fact, the census cards that the census taker um, wrote on are in the Doheny Library at SC. Yeah. And it's online, available online, and you can put in an address and you'll find it. And I found the castle, and my grandmother and my father were living there then, and although they didn't know its name, their, their race, their uh, age, uh, what they were doing, their school, uh, everything else about was how was it heated, when was it built, how much did they pay for it, what is the rent, uh, do they have running water, all this stuff is in there. Um, so they did this survey, and they used that to um, give grades to different areas, A, B, C, and D. D was the mm -hmm. worst, and they gave them colors, and red was the color for D. D. And so that's where the red lining came from. So they mm -hmm. color on the map, a red area, that was D, that was the, the substandard area. So Bunker Hill was declared to be um, a, re a red line. There were other reasons to get red line. One of them was the racial makeup of the area. Bunker Hill was predominantly white, but it was a mixed neighborhood. It was about 12 to 15 percent non-white, which was enough. That was the tipping point. That was enough to get your red line. So the um, banks used that data to get loans, to rate the loans. So a red line area, you couldn't get a loan unless you paid a real high uh, interest rate. So the property owners up here were stuck. They couldn't sell their property. They couldn't get a loan to improve the property. So that's why the city did everything they could to turn it into the slum they said it was. Right, and, and interestingly enough, Gordon, about six months ago, you and I were talking to former CRA officials, and, and Nathan, our good friend who's not here, asked a really good question. He said to this form, CRA was the agency that implemented the redevelopment of this whole hill. He said, so it's interesting, I'm looking at all this documentation and I see that you got all these funds, federal money, to tear down this neighborhood in the late 1960s, but I don't see any conditions for you getting any more to getting any more of the money for putting up new housing. And the former CRA official said, "Oh yeah, that wasn't until like the 1980s that the federal government said if you tear down neighborhoods, you have to put affordable housing out." They, they didn't like; they weren't connected. Even they even just gave that, you money to level the neighborhood and assumed the you would intent, the do the intent good thing. The National Housing Act; they didn't have to do it. They it took just like got 15 money to tear years. it down. So the city used that to get rid of Bunker Hill. So that is old Clay Street. That gate is never open. You have to go into Angeles Plaza and get permission, which is really hit and miss. If you, get, if you get a nice person, they'll let you in. If you don't, you won't. Has anybody ever seen uh, the Exiles? The movie oh, yeah. Exiles? That's where yeah. the Native yeah. Americans are walking down. Clay really Street. nice footage of Clay yeah. Street. Yeah. The Exiles. The Exiles. Exiles, Kent McKenzie film, 1961. Yeah. And, and the reason you have large numbers of, uh, of, of Native Americans living on Bunker Hill is that the uh, Bureau, of Bureau of Indian Affairs was like 
two blocks south of here. And so the idea was, well, let's just get them housing vouchers for the immediate area so it's easy so for them. The idea was to uh, an assimilation. They wanted to get right. the young Native Americans off the reservation and the cities to assimilate them. And that's how, for this film, you're just like, wow, that's really interesting that there's these large population of Native Americans from all over the Southwest. And it's because the federal agency that gave them vouchers was just right there. Like, no, you should here. All right, Gordon, why don't you go up? Let's go up to the, to the let's go up to the road. Okay. Oh, 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 where's Steve? I'm right here. Come on up. Okay, I have really good news. This is, this is, we're gonna, Steve and I are gonna rename this parking lot, and we're gonna rename this parking lot Kurt Meyer Plotz. So there was this, Plotz is a German word for square. Turn around and face me, kiddo. There was this architect, his name's Kurt Meyer. Uh, genuflect, even though he is Protestant. <laughs> genuflect, okay. when you say his name, genuflect. Did you play? He's a Make great Angelina. Oh, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm a good cheap boy. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so Kurt Meyer, I know him because I, I wrote the uh, the HCM, the Historic Cultural Monument application for Linton Savings, which is on the corner of Sunset and uh, Crescent Heights. And that was his first major commission. But he was very civic minded. And in the eight, in the seventies, he, he was he was Swiss. He, he was, was Swiss. Swiss. He was a Swiss. He was national. Swiss. He, he immigrated to the United States after World War II in 1948. Uh, he woke up in his hotel room with his first <laughs> wife. His wife was still asleep. He drove around for three hours. He <laughs> came back into the hotel room. He woke his wife up, and he said, "We're staying." I, the thing I read from the LA Times was he, he drove around and said, we're getting out of here. He hated the place. And then she said, we only had $20. And so he said, I guess I better look for a job. Pam, 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 Pam told me he said we were staying. Oh, okay. I never asked her. I, okay. the, LA, the LA Times opened said that the other way. Anyways, he's very civic minded. Um, he actually sacrificed a large part of his architectural practice to be head of, to be first part of the, the CRA. And it was very important to him. He, he was a commission, just a commission. We're, we're talking, first. okay, so the CRA is really complicated. Yeah. CRA has uh, appointed officials, heads, directors, general managers, et cetera, et cetera. Then there's a commission that sits over it. Like all big departments in the city of Los Angeles, there's a citizen, private citizens that serve at the are, pleasure of the mayor. Unpaid. That oversee, unplayed, they oversee these giant entities that control billions of dollars in revenue. And, and the, CR, the, the CRA was among them, and the CRA is responsible for developing this part of downtown. But to him, it was very important that it, this was not going to be all luxury housing, uh, that it would be, there'd be a mix of immigrants, a, and he, this is affordable housing. It, it's because, a large part of that is because of Kurt Meyer. Uh, he's also he, he, he told yeah. he made the city you have to you put, have to put affordable, affordable housing. senior housing right here you've torn down all of bunker hill all of gordon's friends are gone they've all scattered to the winds and you have to put because, affordable senior housing here because you promised that you would right those people were told yeah. that you're going to be off the hill for two years and we're going to build you housing and you'll be back here in two years and how many years was it before they built this 20. <laughs> Okay, but it came were, back. But, it did. But Kurt, 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 yeah, yeah, Kurt, Kurt Meyer was the president of the CRA Commission from 73 to 78, 1973 to 1978. And he said, we're bringing affordable senior housing back to Bunker Hill. And this is the largest affordable senior housing complex in North America. Wow. Yeah. And what year was the castle moved away? And what year was this built? Uh, this <laughs> is 81. I think this is 81. Oh, the castle was moved in but we're gonna we're gonna get to the castle location okay, later, cool. so I'm gonna hold off. Okay. Know, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, it's like 20 it was years. Well it was before. like 20 years. He wasn't on the CRA when they cleared it. Uh, <laughs> he was. He he did. Okay, help Kurt. Okay, <laughs> one last thing, Kurt Meyer. So the people at the CRA that said the best way to develop cities is to go into the old parts of the cities and clear cut it. Just get all this money from the federal government, throw everyone out, and just level it and start from scratch. Kurt Meyer fired all those people. Yeah. Literally, he woke up every day and said, "I'm gonna. I swear to God, this person is gone. I swear to God, by the end of the calendar year, the person that did that is gone. Literally." And he said this for five years, and they were all gone. 
He removed every single person in the CRA that approved the Bunker Hill redevelopment project. And they went kicking and screaming. Kicking and screaming. And the reason why we have the, a central library, the beautiful central Kurt library. Kurt Meyer. It's Kurt Meyer. Three times they wanted to tear it down, he refused to let it happen. So we're going to rename this parking lot Kurt Meyer <laughs> Plots. <laughs> Go ahead and start walking. Well, let's, let's go all the way up to Grant. I thought we got the corner of Sunset and uh, Crescent Heights as Kurt Meyer plots. <laughs> That's Kurt Meyer Square. Okay. This is the plot. Did I miss the explanation of what? Oh, that's a W. Yeah, this is this is, this is, this is, this is your water. So if you're on the app, there's the black and white photo. Gordon, do you have it? I have it. Okay, it's the black and white photo with the orange border. So Gordon, what are we looking at if we're looking, this is black and white photo with the orange border. Orient us. All right, this photo was taken from uh, Ashley South Bunker Hill Avenue. Which is looking west. Now, South Bunker Hill Avenue would have run doesn't, between... Doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. It ran between Hope, which you see the sign, the street sign down there, Hope and Grand, which is this street right here. It, it paralleled those two streets. It was the highest part of Bunker Hill. And that is looking... Looking west. That first photo with the orange border is looking west from about mid-block right there, but much higher up in a place you can't get now. If you wanted to get an equivalent photograph, you'd have to go up on top of the Broad and take a picture that way. And they that's, would, our, that's our next art they installation. They wouldn't let me in there. So. It's our yeah. next art installation. It's from the rooftop of the Broad. We're going to recreate South Bunker Hill Avenue on that block. Yes. You think I'm joking? Okay. So the hill went that high? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the, uh, yeah. Bunker Hill Avenue was as high as the top of the Broad. <laughs> Does everyone understand that? The street, this street, Grand, okay. So we're second and Grand. Grand Avenue Avenue was 30 feet higher than the street we're standing on right now. In, 19, in March of 1970, Grand Avenue, Hope, and Bunker Hill Avenue were vacated. The city of Los Angeles officially removed those streets from the maps. Bunker Hill Avenue never came back. Hope and Grand, four years later, come back. Hope is unrecognizable. Grand is unrecognizable. Grand Avenue, this street, when it reopens in 1974, has implemented Calvin Hamilton, city planner's dream of separating uh, traffic, pedestrian traffic, vehicle traffic, and industry traffic. Because there's Olive Street is below it. Grand is actually just a bridge. And there's another street, General... It's called the Lower Grand. Lower Grand, General Theodore... It's a Slavic name that I can never pronounce. Forgive me. Polish. Thank you. Polish. Okay. They're really close. They're not okay. I'm gonna stop talking. <laughs> so this reopens in '74. So basically, this street was 30 feet higher. Bunker Hill Avenue was at the top of the road. Gordon, let's keep going through the photos. Okay. Uh, I would say one other thing. The, uh, um, the intersection was up there, but but Grand actually went down that way. The hill was up here, and it went down toward First Street there. So there was a hill here, and you could skateboard down that if you want. <laughs> so um, the, the, the next photo is whoops. Just yeah. Uh, I, while Richard's getting that up, I would also mention that on this corner there was a, a modern apartment building that was built in the 1930s. Next to that was the Carlisle, which was a hotel but was originally a Victorian mansion. Uh, and next to that was the Melrose, which was another Victorian mansion that was turned into a hotel. And next to that, the Melrose Annex. Those were here when the 2nd Street cable car was here. Wow. Not the modern building, but the other two. Yeah. So. Let's look at the photo of the gentleman in the sports coat and slacks. This is taken from like 1940-49. So it's really, really, really great outfit. It's look, we're looking, explain where we're looking. We're looking west on third. We're looking west on second. Right. We're looking west on second from the intersection of second and south Bunker Hill Avenue, which is up there in the air looking uh, down second. Now, what you're seeing, the first intersection, the first street that crosses that is Hope, and the next one is Flower. Now, Flower's down 
parallel and, and uh, at the same level as Figueroa now, right? Yeah. It wasn't in those days. It was up above the second street, the exit of the second street tunnel, the western end of the second street tunnel. And then you can see second street continuing on the distance of crossing Figueroa and going all the way out and then it veers off to the right where it meets up with first street way out in the distance. You did that's, it. That's the bunker hill I remember. I remember when it was like that. So as an exercise, those of you that haven't read John Fonte's novel, Ask the Dusk, you should read it, and those of you that haven't should read it. If you read the, in, the I believe it's the second chapter, he describes his residency hotel, the Alta Loma. The Alta, he calls it the Alta Vista, but in reality it's the Alta Loma. The Alta Loma is, nine, is a nine-story building built down the side of Flower Street. So the, the hill from Bunker Hill Avenue, the distance between Bunker Hill Avenue to Flower Street going west is so steep, his building is nine floors of terrace and the building goes, the numbers go down. So one is the top floor on Bunker Hill Avenue and as you go west and down to Flower Street you get second, third, fourth, fifth and the ninth floor is just above Flower Street. Which is why he can crawl in his which window. Which is why from he can hill. crawl. He, you know, which is why he can crawl in his window. So go read that, and you'll begin to get a better sense. Gordon, I, I want to keep. Um, I want to keep moving. We're, we're in a, I want to um, walk half a block down and have you pick up the castle. But as we leave the Second Street cable car line, I'm going to ask you just to bring us home with this. The sec because we're going to get off a second now and pop down to where the castle was and. In Angel's Flight, so we're gonna we're gonna sort of walk away from the cable car. So why don't you give us your your last thoughts? Oh boy, um, yeah, you know I, I I told you I was been living in Victorian Los Angeles for the last four weeks or so, putting this together. Um, actually, uh, Richard told me you know you. You never left Bunker Hill, and he's right. You know, Bunker never Bunker Hill never left me. Um, I I still am in old Bunker Hill uh, when I want to be. Um, and looking at those pictures of Los Angeles, what a small town it was. What a what a great place it was. Wouldn't, I would just I'd give anything to be able to go and walk the streets down there just a day or two to see what it's like. I don't think I want to live there because I think the people that lived here by and large were by our standards, incredibly narrow-minded and, yes, even prejudiced. I don't think I'd want to be around those people for a long time. But I'd love to go walk those streets and see those buildings and go inside of them. Um, I don't think I'd want to be there either because it's not air-conditioned. <laughs> <laughs> Although, you don't, when we came up the hill, did you feel the breeze? Yeah. That's yeah. why they built the houses up here. That's why they the moved They feel the breeze right now. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because they cite that all the time in the articles and the advertisements yeah. and everything. Um, is that an but ocean breeze that we're feeling? What is that? That's not. Uh, what is it? <laughs> is ocean, ocean? It is. You know, absolutely, it is. Yeah. yeah. But um, uh, what an exciting place to be! How much building there was going on? I mean, people were coming here uh, on those one-dollar tickets from the east, uh, looking for better health and trying to reinvent themselves. And and you saw all that empty open land. What an exciting place to be! To come and reinvent yourself. Let's um. Let's, this is a great vista, Gordon. Why don't we try and take a second, take five minutes. Give ourselves five minutes because I talk a lot. Um, let's look to the north and to the east. Let's look at City Hall. Everyone see City Hall, right? Yeah. Can't miss City Hall, okay. So if this were 1920, all right? If it were 1920, City Hall would not be there. None, none of these buildings would be here, obviously. Let's let's just make that simple. So, what would we see? So, uh, everyone sees the built. Okay, so first of all, there's now a giant cube, which is the federal courthouse, the closest to us. Forget about that. Uh, between the, fed the cube and just past City Hall is the other cube, which is made up of sections, short, small sections, like a concrete lattice work. That's the Claire Shortbridge Fultz Criminal Justice Building. Okay, that is approximately Pound Cake Hill. In 1888, the County of Los Angeles puts up the Sandstone Courthouse, basically on that site. Okay, this is a third. This is a 14-story Richardsonian Romanesque revival 
courthouse built by Curlett and Eisen, the same architects that built the second Los Angeles City Hall that was on Broadway. And that was a beautiful building, and that's gone. City Hall didn't exist. Um, the, the courthouse would have, would have been the most prominent, would have been the most salient feature. And then in front of it was the Hall of Records, which was a Beaux-Arts rectangle uh, that was 1911. Two sections. Two, yeah, two sections, yeah. Twelve stories high. Yeah, and so that's what you would have seen. And that's that's all, there's nothing left. Did the LA Times Castle building? Oh, yes. Thank you, Steve. So you, uh, where the federal, the, the, the glass cube is where the federal court building is that hides the Los Angeles Times. In 1920, the Richardsonian Romanesque Revival Los Angeles Times building with its turret and clock tower would have been very visible basically between City Hall and the Glass Cube. And that, that would have been a very large building. You would have had the Hotel Nadeau, you would have had, yeah. The, I'm, I'm, uh, oh, and of course, the high school. So Gordon, tell us about the high school. Uh, the high school was up on Fort Moore Hill, which is out over, over beyond the uh, courthouse here. Um, it was built um, in the 1800s and replaced the old white wooden uh, high school. They moved that when they built the courthouse because that used to be down on Pound Cake Hill. Um, and the thing that blew my mind, I didn't realize that old high school, not this one we're talking about here that was built later, that one was still there in 1949. I was alive in Los Angeles then when that <laughs> building was there. Uh, I never, I don't remember ever seeing it, but it was still there. But the high school was, was down there on Fort Moore Hill. My father, it when they built the now existing Los Angeles High School, which is mm -hmm. down that way somewhere, they turned okay. this into um, uh, Central Junior High School. So my father walked from the castle to Central Junior High School to go to, to the Junior High School. And, um, and then they tore that building down while he was still in the eighth or ninth grade. And so he went to half day sessions at Belmont High School while he was still in Junior High School. And then they constructed a new high school, which is where the performing arts school is at the corner of Cesar Chavez and Grand. There was a, a new junior high school, so he went there for one semester, and then he went to Belmont after that. Um, but the um, high school, on, on the, which became the Central Junior High School, was on Fort Moore Hill. It had it was red, red brick. It had a tower, clock tower, and that all uh, that actually got torn down when they put the Hollywood Freeway through there. It went right through the middle of Fort Moore Hill. So Gordon, just we've been talking about tunnels and we've been talking about LA Unified High Schools. There are two Hill Street tunnels. They're impossible to visualize if you've never thought about trying to visualize the Hill Street tunnels which are just to the, to the east and to the north of here. But in one of the tunnels under that high school they decommissioned the tunnel and LA Unified used it as an archive. So they took the decommissioned red car tunnel and just stored all their records in it from 1965 to 2004. Wow. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? That's amazing. And it was just, uh, so uh, Cesar Chavez runs into into Broadway and just to the just to the west of that would have been where the tunnel was and that's where they just piled all their records oh. I know it was damp it was gross <laughs> yes. they're at UCLA so now by where the dragons are yeah it's near where the dragons are yeah oh. and, and yeah oh, that was one of the entrances that was the northern entrance and the southern entrance was closer to here Gordon lead the way why don't we walk on this side of the street on the eastern side of the street why don't we walk to where the castle was and that'll put us really close to Angel's Flight and we'll wrap up at Angel's Flight all the way past the road down to where the castle was. Well, I don't get too far because I want to go back to Angel's Flight. Well, we can, we can yeah, cut yeah. across there. Why don't you stop in front of California Plaza okay. and I'll bring up the rear. Okay. Good, great, so people can sit down, good. 
So we're gonna, I want everyone to turn around first and orient ourselves. So we're, we're this is the uh, this is grand. I think this grand. Prom I can never remember the names of these condominiums. It's grand promenade, I think, right here. Is this grand promenade? Where Ocho is? Yeah, I think this is grand promenade. All right. So where the restaurant across the street Ocho is, that's the intersection of Third and Grand. Third and Grand Gordon is a very important intersection, right? Angel's Flight Funicular Station House was basically right here. Third, all oh right, that's right back a little bit, right, right, right there. Uh, the, the, the the Nugent Pharmacy was right across the street. Does everyone have that open? There's a great photo of Dick Powell walking in to the pharmacy. Yep. Keep going. Nope. There we go. Yeah, Dick Powell. Get up, I guess. Okay. We're going to stand here, Gordon. You're going to talk right where I'm talking because I don't want feedback. All right, so Gordon, tell us about... No, actually, Richard. What? You're going to have to stand in front of me. It makes my life easier. <laughs> okay, Thanks. Kim. I'm I here to make it. your life easier. You're doing That was for us, I think. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, so Gordon, we have some great photos of this, of this Victorian building, this turreted market at the corner, the Grand Hotel with the Nugent Pharmacy. Tell us about your childhood memories of Grant of the Nugent Pharmacy. Well, we rode the uh, English Flight quite a lot because English Flight was um, a piece of uh, everyday public transportation. That's the way you got from up here where you lived to down in the city where you worked or you uh, went shopping. And uh, what I used to like to do when I on a hot day, uh, coming up from downtown, uh, getting off the English Flight and walking west on Olive, which is, Olive just ends right here. Uh, I'm uh, Third Street ends right here. It doesn't go down to Olive, but it did in those days. Um, and then we got to the intersection, then we cross over Caddy Corner over there and go into Newton. There's a delicatessen on the first floor, and um, I used to like to buy a Pepsi-Cola out of the cooler there, um, which I think probably cost a dime. Um, and then I'd walk up hill to the South Bunker Hill Avenue. Now, if you look over there right now, I mean, you see that that goes down. You know, it didn't in those days. They got rid of that. Went up to, and it dead ended at South Bunker Hill Avenue. There's a little park there, and that's where John Fontaine's apartment building was on the corner of 3rd and um, South Bunker Hill Avenue on the right, next to that park. You turn left and go down a half a block to the castle, which is back over there behind the um, Wells Fargo. Lots of buildings, and in fact, we were walk I was walking down there because if, if you go down there, you look uh, across. There is a uh, food court, food area at the Wells Fargo Plaza. That's where the castle is. There. Um, but with Dick Powell, if you ever can see the movie um, *Cry Danger*, no, not *Cry Danger*. No. Cry Danger, you're right. Cry Danger. Danger. 1952. He, he's right, driving a Nash. And he comes up Grand. And when he gets to 3rd Street, he turns left and he goes up that little hill and he parks right there. And he and this guy get out of the car and they walk into the Nugent. Right past the cooler with the bottles inside. <laughs> the coolest thing I ever saw when I saw that a few years ago. Um, but uh, I was here all the time. All the time in those days. Cry Danger is a great film for, for the Nugent Pharmacy because, of course, it's, it's this hood, he's, he's hoodwinked. I don't want to give the plot away, but it's like they trick him and, and going into the Nugent Pharmacy. It's a, the, the book he runs his operations out of the Nugent Pharmacy. And they and, and uh, he also goes in because he's after this guy that framed him. And his office is in the... Um, a bar that's at the corner of Olive and Third, across from the um, Angus White um, Terminal, and so you, you see that all those street scenes around there. All right, Gordon, we're gonna we're let's go to California Plaza, okay, just half a block down, and we'll talk about the castle, and then we'll walk across the water court to Angel's Flight, and then we'll wrap it up. All right, so you're gonna lead the way. Okay. Beautiful breeze. I know. They had to build houses up here. <laughs> <laughs> You're right behind me. Do we want to maybe just pop over on the other side here? Sure. Just give me power for you. 
Why? There's some hotel signs on top. Oh wait, you Bonnie Bray like so like what the West Lake? Yeah, Park yeah. Area? Yes, I love that. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> that was a while. Well, I wasn't sure like I was trying to know Bonnie Bray like what part of Bonnie Bray? Oh my God. Okay. Yeah, no, good. It's a good one. All right. So first things, I, I ask people to note that there's a strip of granite paving stones three deep that you saw as we just came in off the street. That's a signature that this is a CRALA property. So, not every property redeveloped by the Community Redevelopment Agency of Los Angeles has that. Some of them have red brick pavers, those are granite. And some CRA proper, CRA LA properties do not have any at all. But whenever you see those three deep granite pavers, CRA LA paid for finance this project. So Gordon, we are at the stop called The Castle. And it has a really cute photo of you. And it has a really nice photo, of, a couple of nice photos of the castle. Yeah. All right, so you basically lived across the street 35 feet up, right? At least that much. Yeah, if you look behind you, you'll see the court at Wells Fargo Center. That, that building. That's, that's the location of the uh, castle. It's right there. Um, now, depending on how many feet of soil they took off the top of the hill, it was up there somewhere. <laughs> above that because uh, Grand is flat here now and it wasn't, it, it, it had uh, slopes to it, it went up and down. And uh, South Hunker Hill Avenue was above the level of Grand Avenue, so you'd have to go up a hill to get to South Hunker Hill Avenue. So it was up there 50 feet up above that, somewhere like that. But that's a, this is approximate location. What am I pointing to? Well, I'm pointing across the street. And as I said, the um, Capitol Apartment uh, were directly across the street. Their back side was on South Punk Hill Avenue. The front side, the front entrance, was right opposite us on Grand, right there. And over here, where we are right now, was the Biltmore Apartments, which was a brownstone um, brick building built after the Victorian area. It was a substantial building with elevators, and it was a nice building. That's gone. Uh, but that's, that's approximately where we're located. The other pictures that you see in here are of the castle in later days. One of them is when it had the chain link fence around it. And uh, they had turned that area right across the street on Grand into a parking lot. Now the, the newspapers of the time in the 1950s and 60s said much needed parking. So this, the top of the hill was all parking. And you'd see some other views when the adjacent buildings are torn down and it's again got a uh, chain link fence around it. There's a picture uh, also of a woman standing out in front of a uh, painting. The artist came up here and painted it because it was going to be gone. Uh, Leo Politi is one of the famous ones that came and painted up here. K. Martin. K. Martin. Yeah, she did a great job. Is that K. Martin? Might be K. Martin. She did a, a, she, her artistic style was perfectly suited for um, uh, the renderings of these, these buildings. Gordon, tell us what happened to the salt box of the castle. Okay, I've, I've mentioned look, this to look, some look people, but phone. I'll... Look at us. Yeah, okay. Um, salt box in the castle. Uh, I think I mentioned before that um, they were going to be saved. Uh, the the, the uh, tearing down of Bunker Hill uh, proceeded in kind of fits and starts. It started up north up there where they tore down that part. Actually, that was not the, that was the county that did that up there, right, Richard? Yes. Yeah, where the music center and the court buildings are. That started up there, and I remember that happening. I remember them tearing all that stuff down in the early 50s. Um, and then it kind of proceeded south, bit by bit. I remember them tearing down the Melrose in 1956. I remember the day that went down. Um, and I think some of the owners, property owners would sell out to the CRA sooner rather than later because it would kind of hopscotch around. Buildings would get torn down and turned into parking lots where there were still buildings around them. Um, but it proceeded down in this direction. Um, and in the early 60s, they reached the 300 block of South Bunker Hill Avenue where we were. And, uh, um, and they, they took the building from us in 1964. And um, by then, pretty much everything was gone except for that, that end of Bunker Hill on South Bunker Hill Avenue. And uh, at that point, somebody said, gee, we ought to save something. 
Well, there wasn't much to save then, except for maybe the cell blocks on the castle. And they were the best of the buildings that were left. There were some beautiful buildings on Bunker Hill in earlier times. Um, they would have been nice to have here, but they were gone before that. Like the Bradbury Mansion that was down there. Um, but at any rate, um, they put a chain link fence around it, both of them. And they sat there for five years up here. Uh, somebody asked me about the uh, album cover for Taj Mahal. He did a, uh, an album in the, when was it, 60s, I guess, 69, right? 69. Yeah, 69, yeah. Uh, uh, he's standing out in front of the, the cell box uh, with this chain link fence around. Um, you know who Taj Mahal is? Yes. Yeah, great musician. But anyway, um, so they sat up there for five years, and they, they really didn't do anything to protect them, but they were still there. I, I drive by, I lived up in Pasadena in those days, and I'd drive the, the Harbor Freeway and look up, and gosh, there they were. They were still up there. Um, and they're going to be saved, and isn't that great? We'll be able to go back into it. Well, other people decided they wanted to go into them a little early because people had jumped that chain link fence, and they went in and they just trashed the inside of them. I've seen photographs that were taken um, at that time of the insides, and they just destroyed the inside of the building, um, which is really heartbreaking to look at. Um, but then they, in fact, did move them. The CRA moved them. They set aside some money, and they, they cut the um, castle into three pieces. Now, these buildings up here on Bunker Hill were built out of redwood, which didn't rot. They were just as good as the day they were built. The wood was just as good. So they were able to cut it into three pieces. They trucked them over to what's now Heritage Square, because they were going to be the founding buildings of Heritage Square. And again, I was living in Pasadena and commuting down to SC, so I drive by and I look over and they, you know, they're putting them back together. They put a new foundation and they're doing this. They put the three pieces back together and isn't that great? And then one day, I was driving down the Harbor Freeway one morning and I looked over and it was a pile of ashes, just like the Belmont Hotel. Uh, some, they, the news accounts at the time said vandals did it, but somebody went in there and decided they were going to do arson and they burned it. So they're, they're gone. Um, but um, they apparently saved pieces of them um, because a few years ago um, I got a message from uh, somebody connected with Heritage Square who had seen me post something on Richard and Kim's site on Bunker Hill and he got in touch with me through that and invited me to go over there to see if I could identify the pieces that they had collected and they have, if you go there now you'll see that they have a glass cabinet that's got pieces of the things that didn't burn, like metal. And uh, so there's a doorknob, there's several doorknobs, so there's a doorknob, there's a cast iron doorknob in that case. And I took it out, and as soon as I touched it, my hand to it, I had this odd experience, I don't know what to call it, um, emotional, I guess you'd say. Some people would say spiritual, but I knew I had had my, this is 50 years later, I had had my hand on that doorknob innumerable times before. And I wasn't sure what it was, I thought it was the front doorknob, that's what I told him, I thought so. But I went back and I have a, a disc of the move, movie um, Kiss Me Deadly. It's a Mickey Spillane noir movie that was shot up all over Bunker Hill up here uh, and was shot in the castle in 1954. And I remember them shooting that because I, I thought that was so exciting. It was like having a movie star in your family. You know, they're going to use our building in the movie. But um, it's shot on the front porch of the castle. And you can see the front door is a double glass stain, uh, double stain, double door, stained glass, double doors. And sure enough, yeah, that's the, that's the front door of the castle. Gordon, let's, thank you, Gordon. That was fantastic. Gordon, let's, let's wrap this up. Let's walk across California Plaza to Angel Slight. Yeah. Okay? And then we'll just wrap it up from there. I think because there is a concert going on, we're not going to turn the PA on at Angel Slight. I think we should go on the upper level. It seems very crowded down there. Yeah, okay. Yes. We're going to go to the upper level. Yeah. I'm not going to turn the PA on once we get into the plaza because there's a concert going on. But let's walk over to the station house at Angel Slight, which has been repainted, and they're going to open soon, and we'll, we'll wrap it up there. All right, Gordon, you lead the way. Let's walk around. <laughs>
gate and walked into the green meadow. called storage. They, they really kind of didn't take care of it. It was just stuck away someplace. And uh, they said it was going to be back in two years at the original site. That never happened. And then in, uh, well, Richard knows the dates better than I do, I can't remember, but in the 90s they put it back here. So they it found was in site. storage for 25 or oh, 30 yeah. years. Yeah. Yeah. Then it was a big deal when it came back. You know, Yule Hauser was here and he did his program that right. year oh, and wow. everything. Yeah. It's south of where it was. Yeah, it used to be at the corner of Third and Hill, next to the tunnel. Right, it goes up like one side. Right, yeah, and that was that was the, the charm and the beauty of that thing. I, I tell people that for a kid living on Bunker Hill in those days, it was the greatest thrill ride that we had because, again, it looks like it's on a single track, right? And then um, they're, it looks like they're going to hit head on, and at the last minute they lurch past each other and pass. Well, if you're in this car going downhill, you remember that scene that Angels like go over Clay Street? So it's up in the pass is up in the air up here. And it's right at the depth of the cutout of the third street tunnel. So it looked like you're gonna get lurched launched off over the precipice. <laughs> and every single time you're saved. <laughs> <laughs> so and it only cost a nickel, all that advantage. <laughs> so um we're, right, we don't want to talk I guess can everyone maybe stand in front of me because I don't want us to talk too loud because of I okay great okay it's good so so Gordon um the courtyard is filled with children up here yeah, yeah. what do you think about that it's kind of neat isn't it I mean usually you come up here and there's nobody up here yeah. <laughs> there's no in the day there were lots of people up here on Bunker Hill. So so I, I bring this up because you grew up on Bunker Hill. Yeah. So what what do you think? So so well, Bunker Hill was a residential area. People lived up here and this is they they commuted down on Angel's Flight to their work and their to do shopping down in town and came back up. So you saw people up here all the time and there were um, businesses up here that um, supplied services to these people. You could live up here without a car, and pretty much you could get all of your um, needs met within walking distance, either walking or on public transportation, because you could get on Angel's Flight, go down, you could catch the red car at the subway terminal, uh, you could catch one of the other street cars, um, and go wherever you needed to go. Uh, so there were a lot of people living up here. Um, it was a great place to live. It was a really nice place to live in uh, the center of the city. Um, so it's nice to see people up here again, although if most of the time you come up here, even during the week, there's nobody up here. Yeah. The streets yeah. are empty. That place is empty. Um, which is sad. You know, it's really sad. Um, I, I think when Angel's Flight gets running again, we'll have well, more Angel's people Flight here. will help because there are a lot of people downtown now at the, the Grand Central Market and so on. That part is being populated again. And so uh, when there's a connection, a rail connection, I think people will be up yeah. here again. So it'll serve its function that they envisioned in 1901 <laughs> when they built the thing. Right. So again. let's so let's talk about this. So so we've been talking around this all day. Um, this Angel's Flight opens Christmas. Uh, sorry, New Year's Eve, December. 1901. 1901, December 31st, 1901. Um, it's a little different than it is today. It, it, it has a major redesign of the track and the station house in 1911, 10 years after it opens. It is rebuilt next to the Elks Lodge number 99, designed by Training Williams. And the Elks Lodge number 99 in 1926 moves to MacArthur Park and gets redesigned by Curlette 
by uh, uh, by Claude Nealman, right? That's right, the Park Plaza, oh, yeah, yeah. right? The Park Plaza with all the angels, the band of angels. So that's Elks Lodge 99, re envisioned in 1926. The original lodge is right here, and that's why the gate at the bottom on Hill Street says BPOE, Benevolent and Protective Order of Elks. So that's when they repainted Right, and that's right. So opens in 1901 and it's white. 1911, they rebuild, they, they build this station house and they redo the gate and they paint it orange. And nowhere on the historic cultural monument application does it say it's orange, which is unfortunate. But it's orange. Is it right orange? You always right. It, it looks like I, Halloween. I think <laughs> that. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm really happy that the Angels White Redevelopment Corporation has taken on this task. I think the orange is a, I don't know. <laughs> no, I tell you, I tell you what, it's, it's give it, good give enough. it, a, yeah, give it 10 fade. years it'll fade. and it'll fade. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're very happy it's here. Yeah. Richard, what did we do? Come on. What did we do? What? Friends know. and neighbors. Come on, tell them. Friends and Neighbors Society. Gordon is the president of the Angels Fight Friends and Neighbors Society. Mm -hmm. And he's the one that got this reopened. Yeah. 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 I can't take all the credit for that, but I'm happy to see it happen. You really got to talk to Richard. Richard has so, quite a lot of That's right, he did. So I think. Um, <laughs> I just gave testimony. So I, I, so I have a phone call with, with the person in charge of the Angel Flight Redevelopment Corporation on Thursday. And I'm hopeful that they're going to hit their deadline of reopening on Labor Day. Oh, which is right. September 4th? Yeah. September 5th, I think? Yeah, the first the first Monday, Monday. of September. I think it's the, the 5th. Are you going to be here for the opening? I oh, hope so. Yeah, I think, I think Gordon's going to be here. You're not going to be in... You're not going to be in... In Lithuania? No, this I'll be year? Good. Okay, okay. <laughs> I missed I missed the mayor's dedication. Uh, it's okay. Because so I was in you, Finland. Uh, you didn't miss much. Finland. So um, <laughs> I don't know. I we we I said we keep it to five, and it's I think it's five. So no, um, Richard. There's one more thing I want you to tell them. Okay. Uh, yeah. I want, I want you to tell them about the other funicular that we rode. Oh yeah. So so Kim and I, as as members of the Angels Flight Friends and Neighbors Society, like to do outreach to other funiculars. I think we're going to go to Latvia next year. Yeah. Um, but we went to Dana Point. There's a funicular at Dana Point. Oh. Yeah. The city of Dana Point has a funicular. It goes from the... Uh, it's uh, Salt Creek. Salt oh. Creek is the beach. It's the name okay. of the beach. And there's a big parking lot there. And they have a funicular down to the beach. It's, it's operational? It's an operational funicular. It's okay, a, it is an elevator. <laughs> it's a you push the button and the elevator comes and this glass elevator on a slant takes you up the hill. Elevator car. It's, it's a, bizarre. It's, it's an evolved funicular. It's, it's, it's a funicular. It's, 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 it's got none of a wacky yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not thing. an open car, but it's it's a funicular. Well, yeah. uh, there was yes, one more recent. Well, fairly recently at Universal Studios, maybe somebody yeah. rode that one. That's the parking right. lot up the Victoria Station, Station. Yeah. Yeah. It was just like that. It was like a glass of uh -huh. there, There's there's someone on the that signed up for the tour that has port flight in their angel in their email address. Are they here? Oh. Well, I, I was just out of curiosity. Port flight. Do, do you have a connection to the? Not really. Just okay. Love, love real yeah. Good for you. Good for you. Good for you. Um, Gordon, so why don't we wrap this up? We're, we can see your seat from here. Why don't you tell us about your seat? Okay. Um, Richard and Kim and I attended a lecture about redevelopment and the, the havoc that it has caused many communities, and not only the United States, but around the world, down at SC a few years ago. And we were introduced to a term called affective ownership. With an A. Affective ownership. Affective ownership. Now, affective ownership is the ownership that people who don't own actually own the physical, they don't have the deed to it, right? But they live in the community and they make use of the facilities in the community and therefore they have an ownership interest in those things and in that community. That's my seat. I own that seat. I sat in that seat, the one in the, the, the back that's open, not inside, 
because again, I was talking about Angel's Flight being the greatest thrill ride for a kid. Uh -huh. That's that's outside. <laughs> but me, right? Yeah, and we were down here a few years ago uh, when KCT Nathan Masters was doing a, a thing on um, funiculars, and uh, and we were being interviewed and filmed down there. And it was still running in those days. And these little kids got on it. Which seat do you think they went to? Right. They went to that one. And when it started, what did they do? They squealed. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my seat. That's wow. that big OK. Ramona, I want you to tell us what your dad thought about Angel's flight. Oh, he loved it. We came down to downtown LA all the time, did Grand Central Market when it was really a market. We rode Thank the you. Angels flight all the time. <laughs> and the red car before it disappeared. Okay. Okay. He met the world of my dad. Your, your father was Ray Bradford. Oh, wow. Oh. Ray Bradford. Ray Bradford. Okay. So Ray, 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 Ray Bradford really loved Angels flight. He really loved Los Angeles. Yeah, he did. My dad, um, living up here in, in, on Bunker Hill in the Depression, more often than not didn't ride Angel's Flight. He took the stairs to save the nickel. <laughs> Other things to spend it on. Well, with two, you can get a Pepsi. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so, Gordon, Gordon set, uh, let's just, what, what, are you, what are your closing thoughts? We've, we've had a wonderful afternoon with you in, in Victorian Los Angeles. You know, Ramona's father has spoken eloquently about these, these iconic Los Angeles locations like Union Station and Angel's Flight as these sort of as these sort of launch pads for our time travel, right? You you, you you got to talk to old friends at Union Station or Angel's Flight. Not necessarily friends that you're literally meeting, but friend you're oh, you get to go know, back yeah. and travel in time. So I'll tell you the um, I, I read someone said once and, and, and it said a lot to me that when you sever the relationship between place and history, you lose something. Something's lost. And what I think is lost is our sense of our who we are, ourselves, because we may not be the direct, the, the direct descendants of the people who came here and gave us all of these things and bequeathed them to us. We may not be their blood relation, but in a civic sense, we're their descendants. And it's important for us to recognize and preserve the things that have value that they left for us and not just obliterate them. All right. That's Thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you, Ramona. Um, if you have questions, we're here. Ask us questions. Uh, next month, August 27th, Nathan Marsak, otherwise known as the Cranky Preservationist, will be giving his talk about the Richfield building, which is at Fifth and Flower, and he'll be talking about the current Arco Tower, which replaced it. We will be walking after his brief slideshow. We will be walking on site to Arco Tower, which has as part of a public art installation in its uh, western courtyard, uh, a public art piece made up of elevator doors from the original Richfield building, which have been um, silver soldered together into 30 foot sculptures. And so, what? I think the people at the LA Times and the, and the editorial court think of me, my name is the one guy Bunker Hill Crank. Because every time they write an article about Bunker Hill, I have something that I have to say and I write them a letter and I send it to them. And they never publish it because I'm sure they get it and they say, oh, that Bunker Hill. We like you. So, so that's, that's, uh, yes, right. So that's August uh, 27th. And, and you can we'll see Nathan's walking. videos on uh, right. Facebook. Look for the Cranky Preservationists. They're a lot of fun. Get on the newsletter, the Lava newsletter. Get on the Essator newsletter. Thank you. Thank you for your support. Thank this you. is a lot of fun. Good Ask job. us questions. Thank you. And we'll see you again. You're dead. Affective ownership. We were all horrified. It's just like the week after Tom Main buys it. And so it's the Boyle Heights Monterey Park Tour. And the first stop is Wine Wood. 
which, uh, start, right. which is yes. deeply in peril. Yes, right. And so, you know, I put on the screen effective ownership, and I say, and what's I'm the screen? Right, and I say, okay, so we're going to talk about effective ownership for the next four hours. The most obvious example of effective ownership is Ray Bradbury's house, which which Tom Main just announced last week he's going to tear down. And, and the woman sitting in the front row starts to cry hysterically. And I'm like, oh my god, I'm never going to get through this tour. We've got to four hours. And like, it hasn't been two minutes, and she's crying hysterically. And then I put a photo of the house up, and you just start crying even more. And my ex-husband like, sounds and like, oh my god, what am I going to do? And I immediately become calmer, because I'm like, okay, good, you're Ray Bradbury's daughter. Okay, yeah. this is why you're, okay. You're gonna be that calmer. was a real shock, because we didn't know if suddenly people were sending us pictures and emails. I went by your father's house today, and look, half of it's gone. Right. And I mean, you're all his daughter shocked. Oh. You know, it, I know it was not done with zero sensitivity well, for the neighborhood, stayed, for the community. It stayed leveled for a long time, I know. for a couple of years. And then they built this monstrosity. Yeah. I, I haven't been to buy it. I don't have the yeah. nerve to go no, buy it. It's not worth it. Did you live in that house when you were growing up? Uh -huh. so we talk about the Bullwinkle. Oh, yeah, we were talking. You had, you had a Bullwinkle? Well, <laughs> they, they did a, a post about the Deadly Deride Emporium. Oh and so I wrote Richard back and I said, I went to Dudley Dubrine Emporium in the early 60s and bought my father a lifetime Bullwinkle. Oh he had it in his office in Beverly Hills forever. What was it made of? It, it was a big stuffed, stuffed Bullwinkle. Bullwinkle. Oh he even had a big because, stuff. Because the animation studio had the gift shop there. Okay, that's right. And when he got rid of his Beverly Hills office and moved home, Bullwinkle was always there greeting everyone at the front door. So we loved that stuff. We were all big kids. My dad, oh, at, at you know, 92, my dad was still big. Oh, he made life fun. I heard him speak a number of times. It was always a good day. And whenever I, I was, said it used to encourage me, he would encourage you, rose colored glasses. How can you be that way? Don't you realize? And then I go, oh, wait, this is a better way to be. It is you a better know? way to look at yeah. things. Yeah, right. it was always a. Uh, <laughs>